Uh, my name is Oleg Shaldabin, and I'm going to talk about finding memory leaks in Go programs. And uh, a little bit about me, I'm a software engineer at Absera. Uh, before that, worked at VMware on Cloud Foundry, and uh, uh, on Cloud Foundry Bosch, which is an orchestration tool. And of course, if you want to follow me on Twitter, there's a handle. And uh, also, uh, Absera. at Absera, we do a lot of cool stuff, and uh, we are hiring. I had to say that. Sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, what I'm going to be talking about is memory leaks in Go. And uh, Go is a garbage collected language. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, everyone knows it, but uh, you still can have uh, memory leaks in it, just as you can with Java, or Ruby, or any other garbage collected languages uh, that you have out there. The good thing is Go has uh, really nice idioms for uh, resource management, such as defers. OK, now it works. <laughs> OK, perfect. Uh, so garbage character language is still prone to memory leaks, just any other, as, as any other garbage character language out there. Uh, has really good idioms for resource management, uh, first, for example. And of course, the rule of a thumb is always, uh, if anything is still reachable uh, from your pro Go program, it won't be garbage collected. And by reachable, I mean uh, there's a top level object references, and of course, the whole object graph that can be reached from that uh, will not be garbage collected, because potentially your program might still use that. And even with all the resource management idioms, uh, there might be problems, such as defers can be misused, and I'll show you a little bit later how. And acquired resources might not be released properly, especially if you do something and uh, then library that you're calling out to does something on your behalf, like creating new objects and doing something, and you do not uh, ask it to uh, destroy them. And uh, the most interesting thing is it is possible to use C with CGO, and then all bets are essentially off. Because then you can use malloc, and when you use malloc, runtime can't help you, so you also have to use free as a rule of thumb. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, several examples, how to detect these leaks. And uh, the very important thing to understand is that even with code reviews and all the good code, code hygiene that you can implement, it all helps, but some things are still not obvious and uh, really hard to track. And uh, measuring and understanding uh, memory consumption is very important. Uh, fortunately, Go uh, has a really good uh, profiler. It is built in, it is in, uh, comes with standard library, and it's called pprof. It's easy to use, and it actually helps a lot in finding bottlenecks both in CPU uh, and um, uh, heap profiling. And uh, also, when leaks are detected, it, not, it doesn't usually happen when you develop your thing and you uh, write some tests with five objects being used or something like that. It actually happens to your production process at the probably at the least convenient time in the real environment where you have a very limited control over its execution. And that's uh, where it's really nice to be able to introspect what's actually going on inside your live process and understand uh, how memory is being used, how CPU is being used, actually what is going on. And uh, let me start with this example. I hope you can uh, see the code here, but it is a pretty simple program that starts an HTTP server. And uh, the very first thing it does, once it uh, receives HTTP request, it adds it to a queue of requests using a, a buffer channel, and uh, it responds back. But then uh, there is a special Go routine track requests that does processing of this uh, request queue. And, uh, for each request in the queue, it creates a tracker, and uh, it calls tracker track, and because we create a tracker and it needs to be closed, for example, we also defer closing this tracker. Uh, this looks pretty innocent, but actually, deferred function will not be called at all. Oh, sorry, de yeah, deferred function will not, uh, will not be called at all, because we do it in a loop, and defer has a function scope. So uh, when you call out a function and it, uh, uh, exits either normally or abnormally. All your defers are going to be called at that at that moment. But here, because it never exits or shouldn't exit in a normal flow of events, these defers will just keep accumulating. And uh, because each defer keeps a closure, so all the objects that are reachable from this defer should also be kept around. And uh, essentially, uh, the reference to our tracker is also kept forever. In this, part, that's a toy example. So it's actually really easy to avoid uh, doing that. Uh, by not using defer in this particular case, for example, or by uh, implementing a function that you immediately call out uh, and uh, uh, do defer inside this function. So when it's done, 
uh, Unifor will actually fire and everything will be all right. But we can say that because it's a, it's a simple program and uh, it's easy to see. But how, how would we prove it just using the built-in uh, profiling tools? Let's take a look at, and yes, uh, there's our problematic code. Let's take a look how we can find what's going on. For that, we're going to use pprof. I don't know how many of you have heard about pprof. It started out at Google as a C++ profiler, and it actually has, it is in uh, Go standard library as well. And uh, it's very easy to instrument your program to either have uh, on-demand profiling uh, or uh, explicitly profile some piece of code. So with memory, it is interesting because, as I said, it usually happens outside of your dev, dev cycle, and you want to be able to introspect the running process somewhere. So uh, your best bet is probably to instrument your program uh, using net HTTP pprof package. And uh, when you start HTTP server, if you have this import line in your, uh, in your Go program, it will actually uh, register a number of handlers that will allow you to uh, connect to them and see what is going on. Uh, enable CPU profiling, snapshot CPU profile, or snapshot heap profile. A uh, really good thing about pprof is that it's a sampling profile. So what does it mean for uh, uh, memory profiling? It means that it only tracks a small percentage of all the allocations that your program is performing. So if uh, people have tracked every allocation, then it would be really slow because there needs to be some instrumentation around each uh, memory allocation, and that's, that's not good. So what it does instead, it just picks every, I guess, one allocation, maybe 500,000 or something like that, and uh, then it approximates real count uh, from these uh, sampling numbers, which means that it's actually okay to use in production. So we do use it in production, and uh, there might be some very insignificant overhead, but especially for memory profiling, uh, with how many allocations you have and with sampling, it's not really that critical. And uh, you might want to run it on some percentage of your servers if you really care about uh, squeezing the last bit of performance from them. But in general, at least on some of them, it is completely fine to run it. And uh, you can profile a running process without affecting its behavior, which is really cool. Uh, so. Uh, as one trick, you can use LSOF essentially on your process and just grab for every port that it listens on and then you will uh, find which port, maybe by some trial and error, but you will find which port profile is exposed on because some servers actually bind to port zero and then start their HTTP server on some uh, ephemeral port and that's where the default multiplexer might also uh, attach the uh, pprof handlers. And uh, you can use go tool pprof command, comes with standard library. You can actually point it to your host on this port, which you either explicitly used in your program for profiling or uh, just found out by introspecting the running process. And uh, if you just run go tool pprof and give it a path to debug pprof heap uh, URL, uh, you can actually get into interactive mode where you can run uh, some really interesting commands, which I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, but also important thing is that you can take a snapshot of your heap and save it locally. And it's just a text file that has some uh, metrics about the current heap usage. And uh, this way, you can actually uh, get a snapshot and then come back later and uh, make a comparison. This way, you can actually understand what object have accumulated in your program over time. And uh, there are several modes uh, the base mode, which I just mentioned, allows you to compare your current profile uh, with some base, which you might have snapshot, I don't know, 10 minutes before. And then uh, it is useful to see what allocations are made over time. So instead of getting uh, everything, you'll just get the uh, everything on over like the last 10 minutes or something. And uh, two interesting modes that uh, heap profiling uh, with people of exposes is in use space mode. It's uh, when you want to see the amount of memory that you use. So it's all all going to be uh, uh, ranked by uh, an actual amount of memory that your objects uh, are allocating or your program is allocating and in use objects uh, will display a number of objects that are currently in use by your program and uh, this is what it usually looks like so in this particular implication there's an example of running uh, pprof uh, uh, on some uh, heap profile which is in temp current heap uh, comparing it with some base, which we snapshotted earlier using the curl command that I showed you. And uh, if you provide, you don't have to do it, but if you provide a path to your binary, 
you can actually, and if you have source code somewhere on your computer as well, you can actually track it back to the actual lines in the source code which are responsible for allocations in your program. Uh, so here, uh, the probably the uh, most uh, used command in pprof is top, which just shows you the top allocations. In this particular case, it shows us the top allocations by, uh, by size. So you can see that there is uh, some HTTP uh, requests that are taken uh, some space, and there's also main track requests that also does some allocations in it. So how do we understand what's going on? Uh, so in use objects is a, another uh, mode that will, sh instead of showing how many, uh, how much memory you allocate, you, it will show you how many objects. And remember, these counts are approximate, but their relative distribution, uh, because of the profile, the profile sampling nature, they are not uh, exact, but their uh, relative distribution is uh, probably about right. So uh, what, do we, what can we do with it? Uh, so, so I just showed you the top command. Then the least command will actually drop you down in your source code. So you can see uh, right here in the track request function, uh, the trackers that we are allocating, they were not garbage collected. Because we took the, uh, uh, we took the base uh, heap uh, snapshot and then we uh, performed a, an incremental profile and compared to snapshots, you see that the objects that were allocated in between are actually trackers, which means uh, trackers are allocated but not garbage collected. Uh, good question, why? So for that, web command will show you a uh, display uh, it will display a profile graph in your web browser, which will give you uh, this picture. So you can see that the top offender here is a read mine header, which is probably where most locations happen in Go HTTP, net HTTP library for requests. And uh, numbers are really important. So 44.5% uh, of of 59% of all allocations have been in this method. So uh, we already figured out that's our request, but take a look on the right here. Lots of defers also get accumulated, which means that uh, they are not actually triggered because we wouldn't see them. They would be garbage collected by now uh, because we took an incremental profile uh, snapshot. So uh, that's basically how, for where toy example, that's how you figure out what's going on. Uh, and using the same tooling, you can actually apply it to a, a slightly more complex programs. So let me show a little bit more complicated use case. So here, uh, we want to implement the uh, request pattern on top of PopSub uh, provided us, uh, to us by NAS. NAS is a message bus that we wrote at Epsera and uh, currently use. So it actually has request pattern built in and uh, it, it doesn't have any leaks, so it works pretty well. But for the purpose of this presentation, I decided to implement it from scratch. So you can see the NAS request method here. It just allocates a new inbox for messages and subscribes to all the messages that come to this inbox. Then it tries to publish requests to a given subject, and it expects to uh, hear the response uh, uh, via this inbox that we just created. Then it waits for a second uh, for the next message that comes in, and uh, when the message comes in, and if it comes in, it just returns with the data that's been uh, stored in the response. Uh, it looks pretty innocent again, but if you actually run this program, you will see that uh, over time, if you just watch the RSS of your process, it will uh, grow. And uh, why is that? That's where pprof uh, comes to help. So if we perform exactly the same incremental snapshot of your heap over several minutes of running your uh, program, you will see that a lot of the time, uh, a lot of allocations actually performed in the NATS connection subscribe method. And uh, if you run, uh, so, yeah, we're interested in what's allocated here. And if you run list from the pprof, you will see that subs subscription structure that uh, NAS allocates to track every subscription we create, uh, they don't get garbage collected. So we actually allocate about 10,000 of, of them in this short period we uh, ran this program. Which probably means uh, they, they're just staying around. And they're staying around because we never unsubscribe. So if you remember what the code looks like, we subscribe, we publish request, we take the next message uh, as a response, but subscription is still there. If someone happens to publish the same inbox that we used, we will still get, uh, uh, the subscription callback will still get fired. 
And uh, we probably don't need it because we just want one request. So what would be the correct thing to fix that? Of course, we can just uh, defer unsubscribing from uh, the subscription that we just created as a part of uh, this uh, function flow. So the reason we use defer here is because we don't really care uh, if function panics or if it finishes abnormally or no matter what happens, we still want to unsubscribe. That's our invariant. And uh, if we do that and we rerun the same profiling, we will see that this time, uh, if you see this thing on the bottom, uh, the uh, in-use objects for the uh, incremental profile comparison uh, did not show us any objects being, uh, new objects being allocated and being still in use in between our uh, pprof invocations. Which means that we are actually doing a great job of garbage, or go around time, actually doing a great job of garbage collecting everything that we have in our program. And uh, if we run uh, on, to on top, if we run pprof with allocated objects uh, parameter, we will see that actually there's been a lot of objects uh, allocated as we go. It's just none of them are actually in use. They are all garbage collected as long as they are not needed by your program anymore. And uh, because you have these two things, it's actually helpful to both find memory leaks and just profile memory usage of your program. Even if you don't leak anything, you still want to understand where your allocations go, what objects uh, you are uh, using, and uh, uh, what are their sizes. So uh, that was a more realistic example. But pprof is not really a silver bullet. So you can still have a memory leak if you use CGO, and it won't actually be detected. So let's say you, we want to use a C standard library directly from Go, and there is a way to do that pretty easily with uh, CGO. There is a pseudo package C, which you can use to actually call out to uh, any C standard library functions. And this particular use case, we want to uh, get our user ID by, by name. And uh, uh, for that, we use get pwnam uh, system call. And uh, because it's a, it's a C function, it actually needs some data that is prepared in a way that uh, C standard library can, uh, can use. So right here, we allocate a buffer with malloc. And we also allocate a C string, which is different from Go string uh, uh, for name uh, of the user. And we actually repopulate that with a, a Go string that we pass into the function. Then we call out to the uh, system call, and uh, then we return the uh, user ID that we got from the system call result. Uh, the, and then we just have this in the loop. So if we run that, we will see that we're still accumulating memory. However, if we run pprof on that, we won't see anything, just because all these allocations are not really tracked by a profiler. And uh, uh, there, there, is, there is no garbage collector that will release this memory for us. So uh, that's our uh, problematic uh, snippet. And in order to fix it, what we should do is first, where we have malloc, we should have three. Uh, with defer, it's, uh, with go, with defer, it's actually, you can probably say by now it's my favorite, favorite part of the language, but anyway. Uh, with defer, you can actually uh, schedule your freeze uh, just when you, uh, just in the same place where you have your malloc. So uh, unlike C, where you would have to track and maybe use some go to logic or something like that to have different snippets of cleanup depending on which code path you took. Here you can say, hey, no matter what happens, I want to deallocate this buffer as soon as the function is done. Same thing with the C string that we uh, populated from uh, Go string. We will free it and uh, we'll, we'll need to do some massaging by basically uh, typecasting it to an uh, unsafe pointer. And uh, uh, that will allow us to get rid of the memory. But the problem is it is really hard to detect it in the first place. So pprof, as I just mentioned, can't really help you. Walgrind, which is a really popular tool for uh, debugging and profiling C programs, also won't help you uh, because first, it doesn't really run with Go out of the box. And even if you, uh, it, it is probably possible to run it with Go, but uh, then runtime will actually stand in your way and it will be really hard to interpret the results that Walgrind uh, gives you, just like with Java or Ruby. That's not super helpful uh, for these high level languages. Again, uh, we need some good rule of thumb to uh, avoid situations like that. And uh, one of them is, uh, if it's possible, it's better to make uh, uh, caller, uh, to avoid making caller uh, care about freeing memory. So if you need to allocate some memory in your uh, CGO code, 
it is better to delegate it in the same function call if it's possible just so that no one else needs to think about the cleanup logic for you. And uh, again, uh, this is a trade-off, but uh, if you need to return uh, a managed Go type from your CGO function, you might uh, consider using Go string and Go bytes helpers in the C pseudo package. Uh, this will essentially copy your data back into a Go world, and then it's all going to be uh, garbage collected. Uh, but it's a trade-off because it involves some copying, and sometimes uh, you might want to introduce something as explicit free method and then the caller will be responsible to calling, uh, for calling this free method uh, at any particular point in time. Uh, so that is basically uh, three examples of how to introduce a memory leak and how to profile it. And in general, uh, profiling can help in a lot more ways than just finding memory leaks. Uh, heap profiling helps you understand, as I mentioned, uh, memory allocations done, done by your program and see uh, where they happen uh, providing an opportunity to actually optimize. And uh, not just heap profiling, actually. CPU profiling is also uh, possible, and with pprof, it works in exactly the same way. So you can actually, it can uh, make a profile, like a 30 seconds long profile of a CPU activity, where you can see the hotspots, and use top command, list command, and everything, just to understand better what's going on. And actually, the uh, Golang blog post about uh, profiling Go programs, it's actually heavily uh, uh, mentions uh, CPU profiling a lot. Uh, there's something about memory profiling as well, but much less than CPU. So uh, definitely consider reading it. There's a lot of good information on how to find hotspots in your programs. Also, uh, measuring is a way to go because uh, most tri non-trivial programs are really hard to reason about. So you need to measure them to understand what actually is going on. And that's where profiling is really helpful. And uh, one thing that would be really nice to have is uh, like with Java, for example, you have Visual VM, where you can actually go and inspect your heap and see what objects are actually on heap. So as far as I know, in 1.3, uh, the write heap dump method has been added uh, to, I think, the runtime package, where you can actually generate this heap dump. But I don't know of any tools that would actually take that and uh, provide you with a nice way of introspecting your heap. There might be some, but if there are none, that's a good opportunity to uh, maybe uh, for, a, for a fun hack, hack project or something. And uh, also, one thing that is very important as we are speaking of memory is Go memory model. Uh, it's not just about memory leaks, but uh, it is important to understand that uh, in order uh, to avoid situation concurrent programs where you don't really uh, it, it might seem that it works a particular way, but it might not work that way. Like imagine if you have boolean variable and then two Go routines actually try to act on that. Uh, that might not work because a Go memory model defines a set of rules uh, for happens after and, happen, uh, and uh, happens before relationship between reads and writes in different Go routines. And uh, you should definitely read, uh, if, you, if you're into any serious Go line programming, you should definitely read the uh, official reference, there's a link uh, at the bottom to understand Go memory model and understand when you ha can have what kind of explicit synchronization you should have between different Go routines so that your writes in one Go routine will be uh, visible by the reads in a different Go routine. And uh, basically, that was it. Uh, any questions? Uh, so the question is, what uh, profiling is good, but what tools you can use to monitor uh, memory consumption and other metrics of your uh, Go programs? So, and uh, yeah, with Java, it's much easier because you have JMX, you have Visual VM, you have all these tools that allow you to introspect the program. Uh, with Go, personally, uh, I haven't found anything that would be actually uh, useful to introspect the state of the process. So usually you resort to external monitoring by essentially making, uh, I know, uh, just seeing how much memory uh, over time your process is consuming and things like that. Uh, but I think uh, with the right heap dump, dump uh, addition in 1.3, I think there are some steps in this direction. So we might 
we might get some good heap inspection tools soon. I hope so. Could you watch the, you mentioned the RSS, could you just be watching that and just kind of say it gets so big or something? Yeah, so you, 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 you can have something like Nagios or something that actually monitors your process externally, yeah, but that would be no different from monitoring uh, pretty much any process in the yes. system. Okay. So that I mentioned, runtime lets you export how many objects are on the heap and the size of it. So oh, that's yeah. a real quick way to get a stat rather than profile level. Yes, so uh, you can actually, uh, yeah, there are some stats that are exported by Go Runtime, uh, which you can also track over time, like how many Go routines you have, what are the uh, different heap metrics uh, and all that stuff. What would be really nice is to actually have tools that consume that and make it available in a really nice way. Someone made like a sample agent for New Relic to send mm -hmm. data called, it's like Go Relic or something. That's basically an agent that'll wrap that runtime, uh, all the GC information and, and maybe some CPU and Go routine and send mm -hmm. it up to New Relic. And if, even if you don't use New Relic, you might want to look at that for some ideas if you're looking at rolling your own or building something similar. Yeah, actually uh, I used to use New Relic for I think that was for Ruby project, and uh, back then it was pretty decent. So if they introduce something for Go, that's actually really good news. So you can probably use that for collecting metrics from your running application to get more insight on what's actually going on. Yeah. Um, when you think CGO, you said that you can use something to copy something back into a Go object, so, mm -hmm. uh, which has been allocated before in C. Uh, or I guess you know to release those, uh, Go uses finalizers. Mm -hmm. Documentation says roughly that you should not use this for memory. Mm -hmm. So, yes, how safe is it to use, well, to let go manage your C objects? So uh, I think uh, these wrappers that allow you to uh, convert between uh, C data and Go data, they actually make a copy, so uh, then you don't really work with, it, uh, with the original data. So they have to copy the whole buffer and then uh, wrap it around in the Go uh, format, and then your runtime will manage that. Okay. And, then, mm -hmm. and roughly how safe would it be to trust finalizers as, as long as uh, or when it comes to memory? Yeah, I, I think in general you shouldn't trust finalizers because they are almost never guaranteed to run when you want them to run. So it's, it could be a nice uh, strategy for potential cleanup, just if you want to do things right. So you're saying, hey, I actually want, when, when this object gets uh, deallocated or destroyed by garbage collector, I want, I want this to run. But it shouldn't be anything mission critical, just like with Java, there, I don't think uh, runtime gives you any guarantees on that. Yeah. Um, do you know if something like this is compatible with a Go runtime for App Engine? I mean, it just seems to me like it wouldn't be, right? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I don't think it will be because probably in Sandbox uh, you won't be able to use it, but I would definitely try it out. Who knows? Maybe it works. I haven't tried myself. Okay, thank you.